Hi, good morning, everyone. Once again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Without further ado, we're going to start the event now. So please join me in welcoming our Dean, Professor Lionel Wee, who will give us his welcoming speech. Professor Wee, please. Okay, well, uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for accepting our invitation to experience learning at FASS. And we really hope you'll enjoy your morning here, engaging with our professors. For those of you who are not familiar with the College of Humanities and Sciences, our aim is to prepare you for a constantly changing world. By the time you graduate, the world will be even more complex. And it's our goal to help you to be able to be adaptable, resilient, and empathetic. These are some of the attributes that will help you to flourish. The College of Humanities and Sciences a core curriculum provides you with strong foundations in reading, writing, critical thinking, and numeracy. It will expand your learning capabilities and enhance your ability to think and integrate knowledge and insights across different disciplines. And this is an ability that is integral to solving complex problems. What I want to do for the next few minutes is to take this opportunity to maybe address and try to dispel some myths. Some of you may be concerned that you will not be able to get the major of your choice. This is not true. The CHS FESS program offers great flexibility and choice. With very few exceptions, you are in fact guaranteed the major of your choice. For those of you who do not want to commit to a major yet, you can most certainly spend your first year exploring before making a decision. And if you've chosen a major and later on decide to pursue another discipline that suits you better, you can change your major within the first four semesters without any fuss. Uh, we offer many combinations and possibilities from a wide range of 20 majors. You can pursue them as a primary major, a second major, or a double major. We also offer over 30 disciplinary and multidisciplinary minors so you can broaden your educational journey with us. You can combine your passion for the humanities with the sciences or with any other field seamlessly. In other words, if you're already committed to a specific major, we will accommodate that. If you have not made up your mind, there's no rush. And if you later change your mind, that is not a problem. With that, I hope you enjoy our masterclasses delivered by some of our best educators. Our colleagues and students are all here, ready to answer any questions that you may have. And I look forward to welcoming you all to FESS and to the NUS, NUS community. Uh, feel free to approach me for a chat later on. I'm wearing something distinctive, so you cannot miss me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. Now, next up, to give you a little taste of what we have to offer, please join me in welcoming Professor William Bain from the Department of Political Science to deliver his masterclass on the wisdom of liars and the ethics of war. Professor Bain, please. Thank you. I want to begin by extending a very warm welcome to each and every one of you to NUS and especially to FAS. Um, there's nowhere I like being more than in the classroom with students. And so as I look out here and I see prospective students, it's very much my hope to see you in one of my classrooms uh, uh, next year. I want to begin by posing a question. What justifies the invasion of Ukraine? Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, provides an answer to this question in a speech he delivered on February 24th. In this speech, he describes the eastward, eastward expansion of NATO as an unacceptable threat to Russia because it upsets the balance of forces. But the problem or the prospect 
of Ukrainian membership in NATO amounts to something more fundamental than the number of aircraft and tanks and where they're located and how close they are to the Russian border. Putin in the same speech went on to lay claim to Ukrainian territory. Specifically, he said that Ukraine is our historical land, despite the fact that Ukraine is an independent sovereign state and a member of the United Nations. Putin went on to say that defending this land is, quote, a matter of life and death, a matter of our historical future as a nation. Now, the Russian complaint goes further than just the expansion of NATO. Part of the grievance is the way in which the West has gone about its international relations. In the same speech, Putin condemns the behavior of the West as irresponsible. It reflects an arrogant form of modern absolutism that is disdainful of Russia's legitimate demands. In other words, what Putin is complaining about is that the West is, in a word, selfish. The West observes international law when it is convenient. Putin gives several examples as evidence, including the interventions in Kosovo, Libya, Syria. But one example stands apart from all others, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. The United States and its allies used weapons of mass destruction, the, the allegation that Saddam Hussein possessed uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction in violation of UN resolutions as a pretext for war, a war that caused tremendous loss of life, damage, and destruction. And it was, according to Putin, all for a lie, a lie that was propagated at the highest levels of the American government. Now, from what we've said thus far, we might say we've gained a certain amount of insight into the character of international relations. The United States stands accused of serial deception. It is, according to Mr. Putin, an expert practitioner of dirty politics. In fact, Putin describes the United States as a con artist that acts contrary to principles of international relations and generally accepted norms of morality and ethics. To drive the point home, Putin said in this speech, and I quote, where is the justice and truth here? Just lies and hypocrisy all around. But the problem isn't just the United States. It's the entire Western bloc, which he says is formed in the image of the United States. And it is part of the same, and again, I quote, empire of lies. Now, at this point, we might pause and reflect a bit and ask ourselves, well, who exactly is the renegade in this instance? Russia's war aims include protecting the people of Donbass, who are said to be facing genocide, and also demilitarizing and denazifying the Ukrainian regime. But there's no credible evidence that the Russian-speaking population in Donbass is facing genocide. And it's certainly a stretch and indeed a, a gross exaggeration to say that the Ukrainian government is led by a group of neo-Nazis. We might also consider Russia's conduct in the war. The devoted soldiers of the Russian army, as Putin describes them, are responsible for the indiscriminate shelling of schools and hospitals, the looting of personal property. In fact, one of the striking images of the war 
is of Russian soldiers retreating from the suburbs of, of Kiev uh, on vehicles with, with home appliances, washing machines and so forth loaded on as they retreat. They went into houses and simply looted not only the food but the appliances and, and other belongings. But it's worse than that. Russian soldiers are widely responsible for committing instances of summary execution and torture and also using sexual violence, rape, as a weapon of war. A recent newspaper or uh, editorial described the scale of the atrocities committed by the Russian army as staggering. It's estimated that there are 21,000 dead civilians in Mariupol alone. And just yesterday, satellite imagery was published in Mariupol uh, that depicts a massed grave that is larger than three football pitches. Or to put it differently, this mass grave is over 340 meters long. And it's believed to contain some 9,000 bodies. If we look at the suburb of, uh, of Kiev, uh, Bucha, we find that 900 bodies have been found in the streets, many of which were shot at close range with their hands bound behind their back. So how exactly do we make sense of all of this? I'd like to suggest two possible answers. One answer is that war is estranged from moral judgment. We often hear that war is hell or, or all is fair in love and war. This is a way of saying that the law ends when war begins and that moral principle has no real substance or makes no real contact when it comes time to waging war. The other answer I want to suggest is that war is a regulated activity and it is subject to rules of restraint that repose in the UN Charter, the Geneva Conventions, international humanitarian law, and other instruments of international law. And it's in light of these rules and these instruments of international law that we say that some wars are legitimate and others are not. I want to defend the second of these positions. Now, in doing so, I don't mean that the rules of war are always observed. Indeed, the rules of war are violated at times, just as motorists exceed the speed limit on the AYE pretty regularly. But I do want to argue that the conduct of war is governed by genuine rules that are not simply expressions of expediency. That is to say that they're observed only when it's convenient, but rather they impose genuine obligations. So what are these norms? Well, we, we don't have time to go through all of them. I teach a module called International Ethics where I delve into this in great detail. But I'd like to provide just a little bit of a sketch of what I'm talking about. One of these norms is the principle of just cause. This is a fairly straightforward idea, which holds that war is a response to an injury received. In other words, we, we accept or recognize this idea that it is legitim legitimate to repel force with force. This is the idea of self-defense, that you're permitted to defend yourself if somebody uses force against you. This principle, this idea of self-defense, is enshrined in Article 51 of the UN Charter, which says that all states have an inherent right of self-defense defense. Now, as it happens, Vladimir Putin invokes Article 51 in the speech that he gave on February 24th. He says that Russia is defending its people, namely these Russian speakers that live in Ukraine. The problem, though, is that Putin's claim doesn't satisfy 
the ordinary meaning of self-defense, not least of which is that Ukraine has not attacked Russia. Another principle that uh, uh, relates to the ethics and law of war is the idea of right authority. Now, right authority is about limiting who's entitled to wage war. The idea here is that war and waging war is not the business of private individuals. Um, and it's not um, uh, the business of non-state groups or corpora uh, corporations. For example, Singapore Airlines is not entitled to wage war against Emirates in competing uh, in commercial aviation. Just as the owner of your favorite chicken rice stall is not entitled to wage war against a competing stall. Although, if I'm honest, I would plead for an exception, perhaps, given my experience with StarHub's customer service as I was trying to relocate my internet. But the point here is that only states are entitled to wage war. Now, Russia claims to be providing mutual assistance to republics in Ukraine that it has recognized as independent, and that these, these republics um, do have right authority, that they are entitled uh, to wage war. But this, again, strains the principle of right authority. The Russian argument in this regard is something like Malaysia recognizing an HDB estate in Woodlands as being independent and then invading Singapore to support that population. Another principle, one at which you will have encountered quite regularly, in fact, it's, it's almost always the principle that, that, that arises first, um, when war is reported in the news. And this is the principle of discrimination. Now, this principle holds that only combatants, that is, those who engage in war, are legitimate targets. That is, those who are actively prosecuting the war. To put this slightly differently, to be a soldier is to pose a threat. And because soldiers pose a threat, they may be legitimately killed. In contrast, it's impermissible to kill the innocent, those who are not engaged in the activity of war. The idea of being innocent or the definition of innocence is to pose no threat. It's the opposite of being a soldier. And because they pose no threat, they may not be targeted and they may not be killed. Now, we have to recognize that the distinction between legitimate and illegitimate targets does not always coincide neatly with the distinction between combatant and innocent. For example, factory workers that make munitions contribute to the war effort. So there is the question of whether or not these people can be killed while they are at work making tanks or aircraft or, or, or ammunition of, of some, some sort. But this doesn't get away from the fact that it is impermissible to deliberately target civilians. And it seems that in the Ukraine war, the Russian army has disregarded the principle of discrimination almost entirely. Indeed, some reports say that the Russian way of war is to deliberately terrorize civilians. That's actually part of the strategy, is to terrorize civilians in order to uh, subdue entire populations. Now, this is a, just a very brief sketch of some of the principles that arise when we talk about the ethics of war and how war should and should not be conducted. But to this point, it doesn't seem like we've made any progress. 
Putin, in his speech that we started with, decries the opportunistic West for appealing to international law when it is expedient. And at the same time, it remains silent when the rules of international law are inconvenient. But if we look at Russia's war in Ukraine, it seems to rest as well on a dubious pretext. And it is distinguished by brutality that a recent Washington Post editorial described as something that shocks the conscience. Indeed, it seems that everyone is caught in a web of lies, at which point we might feel the need to throw our hands up and declare the ethics of war a profound waste of time, at which point you should not enroll in my module and perhaps you might consider another major. I want to suggest why that would be a mistake. And it's here that I turn to the wisdom of liars. Now this might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but liars provide us with something very, very important when it comes to evaluating the ethics of war and the ethics of international relations writ large. And the reason why is that liars and hypocrites provide the best evidence of what we seek. Of course, hypocrisy and deception is rife in international relations. Russia's war in Ukraine is no more about genocide than America's war in Iraq was about human rights. It's in light of this hypocrisy, the prevalence of deception and the like, that it is easy to dismiss moral talk or ethical discourse in international relations as just that, talk. This is called the window dressing critique. And the idea here is that the language of ethics and morality is used disingenuously to disguise less salubrious motives and to mask the pursuit of selfish ends. But this tells us, this window dressing critique, this tells us um, something that's quite limited about human conduct, international relations included. And the reason why is that inferring motives from actions can be quite misleading. And the reason why is that actions can be interpreted in different ways. Consider the act of giving to charity. I might give to charity because I genuinely care for the needy and feel an obligation to assist them. But I might also give to charity to appear virtuous, so people will hold me in high esteem, so perhaps I might be awarded a lucrative contract. So just observing actions can be misleading, and for that reason, it's limited. The point here is that hypocrisy and dishonesty doesn't render ethical discourse irrelevant, precisely because it's important to be seen in the right. Vladimir Putin invokes the language of self-defense and genocide to give his special military operation an air of legitimacy. And the name here is instructive. The Russians don't refer to this as war. It's a special military operation. Why? Because the legitimate resort to war is limited to two conditions alone self-defense, and collective action authorized by the UN Security Council. And this operation satisfies neither of those conditions. So call it something else, a special military operation. I want to suggest then that the window dressing critique is incorrect because if ethical discourse was simply a mask and if hypocrisy is all there is to the language of morality, morality and ethical discourse, then there would be no point in trying to fool people. We would all know that any resort to, to ethical discourse is hypocrisy. It's a lie. It's a deception. And we'd all know that. And there would be no point in referring to it or invoking it at all. There'd be no point, again, in trying to fool people. They'd already know. 
What's important here is that the hypocrite and the liar presumes moral understanding. In other words, to lie is to affirm recognized values and principles, not because they're useful and expedient, but because they speak to what we think is right as human beings and societies. Therefore, it cannot be that the war is untethered, and the, or rather the activity of war is, is untethered entirely for moral standards. Why? Because liars and hypocrites provide the best evidence of those standards. The fact that they make the effort to lie and deceive affirms those standards that we recognize. Now, in recognizing the authenticity of ethical discourse, this doesn't require us to pretend that the world is better than it is. Brute power is a fact of international relations, as is narrow self-interest, and we shouldn't pretend otherwise. But ethical standards are also equally a part of international relations, and that is evident in the way in which we speak about the world. Pick up a newspaper on any given day. When I give a lecture on the ethics of war in my international ethics module, I always start with the newspaper that day and say, this is what you find. Every single day, you will find ethical discourse in discussions of politics. Why? Because politics and international relations is shot through with eth ethical claims, and it's unintelligible outside of those claims. Prime Minister Lee gave a speech just last week in which he said the war in Ukraine raises some awkward questions for China because the war violates closely held principles, namely territorial integrity, sovereignty, and non-interference that are part and parcel of China's foreign policy and discourse for decades. And these principles are unintelligible. They make no sense without understanding their moral significance. So in suggesting that ethical claims are integral to international relations, I want to suggest that our challenge in our world is to navigate a world of conflicting values, conflicting principles, and, and conflicting imperatives while being attuned to the reality of self-interest and hypocrisy and deception while giving none of that unqualified justification. Thank you. I'll leave it there. <laughs>